Wir kommen nun zur ersten Keynote. Ähm, digitale Kulturen, das geht einher, wir haben es vorhin schon gehört, mit Disruption, mit schnellem Wandel und natürlich hat es uns auch erwischt, äh, nämlich die Flugpläne unserer äh, Keynote-Sprecher sind des Häufigeren geändert worden. Leider ist die Papierdruckvariante des Programms nicht ganz so schnell zu ändern wie die Wünsche der Flugpläne und der, äh, der Möglichkeiten, was die Fluggesellschaften so leisten können. Insofern mussten wir heute Vormittag die zwei Keynotes tauschen. Das heißt, der Herr Stallman spricht als Zweiter. Lora Arroyo von der Freien Universität in Amsterdam spricht als Erstes, damit Ladies first. Ansonsten hätten wir gesagt, America first. Und danach erst Europa. Ähm, der musste einfach sein, der kleine Joke. Ich hoffe, Sie verzeihen es, aber in heutiger Zeit muss man ja auch immer ans Politische denken, ähm, was wir hiermit getan haben. Ich freue mich jetzt auf die inhaltlichen Punkte, insbesondere im Kontext digitaler Kulturen zu kommen. Ähm, Laura Arroyo, please come over. Uh, we will switch to English now, uh, because digital culture and a lot of content in this context means we have to be global and we will hear about all these things from Laura. Thank you very much for coming to Chemnitz and I give you over the... Oh, no, you, you will do that. I will just recover that and... Okay, we're good. Okay. Yes. Thanks. All right, um, well, um, I am going to talk today um, a lot about, uh, in the context of digital cultures, um, I'll give you some example for real digital cultures, but what I would like to start with is actually talking about another type of culture, as we are moving from Uh, regular uh, culture and arts around us in the physical world into a digital one, uh, we also observe lots of changes in our research culture that we need to change in order to be able to embrace the diversity um, what uh, arts and culture are um, uh, presenting. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of um, a little bit of uh, uh, background about myself, uh, and hopefully this also will give you a, a context in the things that I'm going to talk later. So uh, I think most of my career I've been uh, working in the area of applying semantic web to achieving personalized and interactive access to uh, various type of content online, very often uh, multimedia, um, and that's also the link to uh, cultural heritage. Uh, most of the applications domains that I worked on uh, were centered around uh, various uh, museums, uh, archive, digital archive libraries, uh, and so on. And uh, recently also uh, I've been focusing a lot on um, a different type of users, not just the regular users for which we did a lot of um, uh, interactive, personalized interactive interfaces like uh, museum guides or personalized TV guides and so on. But there is also another group which uh, also belongs into this larger context of digital cultures and those are the humanities scholars. Uh, the humanities professionals and scholars that use this rich information we provide digitally and they also need to be supported and they become digital humanities, uh, transform uh, their work into the digital humanities space. And uh, I've been doing a lot of this work uh, in the Netherlands, in uh, the Free University in Amsterdam, um, uh, and what we sort of, under the cover, uh, under the, the hat, Uh, user-centric data science, collecting a lot of data from 
users, from uh, professionals, um, uh, from scholars, and uh, trying to provide this personalized, um, uh, personalized interaction for them online. Um, and recently, I've been also sort of hopping off uh, on and off uh, between Amsterdam and New York uh, to breach the data science, uh, this user-centric data science in Amsterdam with the Columbia uh, data science at the University of Columbia. Uh, and as well doing some uh, quite interesting experiments uh, in the startup context uh, with a company called uh, Tagosaurus. So, uh, well, as I said, Semantic Web has always been very central uh, in my research, and I think it's also uh, quite, an, quite a pillar in the way we uh, interact with knowledge or uh, inter sort of provide knowledge support online. And I would like to um, give you a short historical journey, uh, a journey that uh, really describes the evolution, very briefly, the evolution of uh, uh, Semantic Web and uh, going to some of its earliest roots uh, uh, related to uh, development in um, around 1980s, um, where expert systems were very central, and the hype of these expert systems really led to a boom of AI in the 80s and what I call the AI winter in the 90s. And I think this is very important in order to understand the message that I'm going to give uh, later. So in the 80s, um, well, what happened is uh, uh, one of the major things that actually uh, happened and was important in this uh, context is the fact that the uh, computer science world finally broke out of the tyranny of the mainframe. So as we see right now, already in the 80s, computers suddenly became everywhere. And the true development of AI system started. And during this time, AI world primarily focused on expert systems and uh, expert knowledge and defining rules to capture uh, this knowledge. So most of the researchers really believe that human experts and their expertise is the central to capture uh, system intelligence. And I would like to name a, a few examples, uh, and I find those are, uh, according to me, fi foundational examples. Uh, uh, Piero Bonissone at uh, General Electric, who built uh, an expert system to uh, diagnose diesel locomotive failures. And he did this by interviewing uh, the main, um, uh, so the, the main repairman of the company in the last uh, years of uh, his career, kind of capturing uh, his brain digitally. And then there is another uh, project, the Mycene project in Stanford, and this work uh, keeps uh, living um, uh, uh, also today, as part of the Mark Musen's group, uh, uh, Biomedical Informatic, uh, Information Research Department, uh, and this group gave us Protege, one of the uh, the, the central tools in the uh, knowledge representation uh, era. And in this period, also uh, researchers in the 80s were drawn primarily uh, by the problem of how to acquire uh, various types of expert knowledge and uh, put them as part of machine knowledge. And then in the 90s, uh, a central example, CATS, which further became Common CATS, uh, was uh, founded by Bob Willinger um, and was further extended as, as part of the vision of the semantic web uh, by Frankfurt Harmele and Huskyber. And it, this is a very interesting example because it was really uh, a methodology for expert uh, knowledge acquisition. And it was all about people, uh, what they know, how they know it, and how we can actually acquire this knowledge. Um, and somewhere during this decade, the prevalent notation for knowledge acquisition became something which we now call a knowledge, uh, knowledge graph or labeled graph, uh, where you have nodes and edges, and nodes uh, uh, denote entities, and edges denote uh, relations. 
And then we come to the 2000s and uh, the success of the large-scale web-based systems uh, and the massive decentralization during the 2000s really led to a growing demand of in for interoperability. Interoperability was very central in this uh, era and this was also the start of the vision for the semantic web. Um, and this vision uh, was redefined several times through various uh, standardization efforts. Um, and knowledge acquisition community was one of the loudest that actually was calling for uh, standardization. Suddenly there was uh, this realization that all the knowledge that has been acquired over time, all the, uh, all the tools that uh, performed knowledge acquisition, uh, suddenly they really needed support in order to share this knowledge across different systems. So interoperability became very important and the graph um, uh, based uh, formalism become extremely central in capturing um, and uh, providing this kind of interoperability. Um, so, in, so, in a way, the um, uh, knowledge acquisition uh, uh, from experts continued. But what is interesting about the 2000s and here the culture aspect comes in is that uh, now we are not just dealing with um, uh, expert systems in very specific expert domains like locomotives or uh, medical domain, but we have much richer uh, uh, knowledge around us, cultural knowledge around us. So it began to explore new kinds of expertise related to cultural heritage, humanities, arts, uh, media, and so on. And suddenly there was this realization that this kind of knowledge um, uh, studying cultural heritage uh, requires different um, a way of acquiring it, a different way of understanding the, uh, the expert knowledge and different way of capturing it. And the present decade, uh, the, uh, uh, I really think it's uh, uh, quite, an, uh, quite an interesting uh, uh, sort of parallel of the present decade which easily would have surpassed the 80s. Uh, where 80s experienced the same boom in terms of excitement, investment, and hype in AI. We have already easily surpassed this uh, in terms of actual results uh, that work in real world systems. Um, and I do think that if we look back uh, from the future in, onto this uh, uh, moment, we will really call this the golden age of AI. And the nicest thing about it is that we are all in the middle of it right now. Uh, so one of the, the sort of the milestone examples for the 2000s or the, the, current, uh, um, uh, the current era uh, was the IBM Watson system. So and it's uh, typically the question is to, to people ask is did Watson um, um, sort of cause the rebirth of AI in some way? And uh, it's not an easy question to answer, but it's also, if I look back, it's so difficult to remember if we don't force ourselves uh, to remember what exactly was before that. So this was, was one of the reasons to give you the historical look before that. We're so used to this new era right now uh, and all this real explosion of uh, um, uh, AI system. Uh, what Watson represented is really a benchmark in human question answering expertise never seen before in an open domain uh, at the scale and uh, in terms of speed and um, knowledge uh, uh, that it was dealing with. But what's interesting, coming back to the knowledge acquisition aspect, it wasn't built by interviewing experts. It wasn't built by acquiring directly knowledge uh, from experts. And it did use a lot of uh, human knowledge, like DBpedia, Yahoo, Freebase. However, the idea of acquiring knowledge from experts was completely uh, and radically changed uh, uh, in this. And what did change, for one thing? Uh, it is no longer exclusively about the experts. Um, and it's not longer uh, only about rules and only about uh, deductive reasoning as we used to from the expert systems. Um, and I think it is still about people, 
Um, but in this case, it is the, the, the research, it's much more uh, integrating the relationship between people uh, and the rise of big data. And when I say people, they are also different type of people, different type of the experts that we used to know. And these are massive amounts of people that not necessarily have to have the traditional professional expertise. Um, and now we can actually acquire their knowledge at scale. Um, and they uh, prove in many, many cases to be very efficient in um, acquiring hidden uh, knowledge layers, hidden knowledge interpretations in a vast amount of uh, digital data. Um, <clears throat> so now I think I'm done with the historical thing and what I want to uh, sort of summarize uh, reflections on this history is that um, the, the history and the legacy from expert systems, knowledge acquisition, and um, the semantics in forms of uh, labeled graphs really created some kind of comfort zone. Uh, and this comfort zone is defined by a set of assumptions that we very rarely question. Uh, we, we also even rarely consider the way they shape uh, our work and um, the way that they've created kind of a tunnel vision for us. Um, so in uh, 2014, we published a paper in AI magazine uh, where we identified uh, seven myths. Uh, and we show how these seven myths have direct impact uh, in the way we approach systems and um, uh, human knowledge. And the, the most important part of these seven myths is um, uh, fundamental aspects of the, uh, defining the comfort zone I just mentioned, is that uh, we assume there is one valid uh, and correct interpretation for every example that we see around us, that there is always true, so every example should fall in either true or false bucket. And the second assumption is that there are all the examples uh, that are creating, uh, 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 composing this uh, uh, graph, a uh, knowledge graph, uh, are as important as, each other, uh, as any other. Um, another one is uh, collecting, when collecting human judgments uh, or uh, acquiring knowledge from humans, disagreement is a bad thing. Um, and the issue here is that the disagreement itself is not necessarily a bad thing. The disagreement here is a sim symptom or a signal that something's wrong. And when you're trying to eliminate the disagreement, you're not necessarily eliminating the problem. So uh, it's kind of interesting that for all this history of uh, expert systems and to this day even, uh, our community has been overly focused on um, eliminating uh, the disagreement in order to show quality. However, in the work that I'll show you uh, further on, we have proven that this is an disagreement is actually an important signal and we shouldn't eliminate it. We actually uh, should encourage it and harness it. Um, so uh, another one uh, of those assumptions is that uh, experts uh, are the only sole um, arb arbiters of truth. Um, and this is uh, the roots in, uh, from um, expert systems, as I showed you before. Um, and it's kind of strange that we start treating them not as regular people, so people who have their opinions or uh, perspectives, but some kind of oracles that have uh, universal and objective knowledge about the world. And when I say it this way, it sounds obviously flawed, However, we have been following this uh, uh, myth or this assumption um, uh, uh, quite consistently until now. And another one, um, uh, which focuses on the fact that in our community, uh, 
it has been very rare when you uh, acquire knowledge from experts, actually to acquire knowledge from more than one expert on single examples. And it's typically driven by economy. It's expensive, experts are scarce and uh, 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 difficult to find, don't have enough time and typically quite expensive. Uh, so it seems like uh, uh, it's a waste of money to ask two people uh, their opinion on the same example. And of course, we want to optimize their time to gather as more data as possible. So, um, uh, and the, the thing here is that you can also see how uh, this decision uh, uh, felt like a comfortable decision and a good decision when you uh, put it in the context in the previous four meets that I described. And their final two ones, unfortunately, I think uh, in interest of time, I won't be uh, covering them, but all in all, those seven meets really define this binary world, binary world where everything should be either po positive or negative, true or false, and that there's uh, uh, one standard way of acquiring this knowledge through experts, and in many cases, a single expert could be uh, giving you uh, all this um, uh, truth. So now let me give you some examples um, uh, in order to prove my point, hopefully, uh, even further. Um, so this is a typical uh, image annotation task um, uh, in terms of acquiring, uh, doing a knowledge acquisition. So you can have an image, and in this case, you have a question, does this image depict a woman? And the only possible answers are yes or no. And, well, I challenge you to tell me whether it does depict a woman. Probably the ones from the back will say no. The ones that are closer by will actually see the woman in the picture. And then you go further. Uh, and what about this one? Does it depict a woman? And remember, you have only yes or no. You, ca you cannot explain anything further. Or, or there is no middle situation. And what about this one? Um, and it's interesting if you sort of, let's say, let's find an expert and ask. And maybe an expert will give this kind of answer. Because, well, we are very, our visual senses are extremely intelligent, so we have background knowledge, and we can assume all those three actually do depict woman, women if we have only yes or no answers. If we ask a random person from the crowd, a lay person, which not necessarily is a visual expert, they might give you exactly the same answer. But what if we ask another one? They might give you this answer. And you can see that this answer, what's wrong with this one? Well, we don't really see a woman in the, we assume that it's a woman. We don't see a woman, we, woman in the last one. We again assume there is a woman. And uh, what about if we ask another person? Here the answers again keep on changing and it's quite interesting to see, well, the answer is never yes or no. We always deal with ambiguity. Um, and uh, if we ask a lot of people, enough people, the question is, are they uh, all their answers are going to converge to some kind of stable distribution? And what we saw in our experiments that it d indeed does. So a single person can never give you a reliable answer because it is will be just one perspective on what you're seeing. But if you aggregate all the answers uh, of the, the different people together, you can actually come to a, a quite nicely convergent distribution, which represents much better the ambiguity in those images. In the first image, it's the only image we actually see a woman. And it is, but it's sort of put in a context that kind of obscures this. So it's closest to the answer yes. However, in all the others, they have a partial yes answer. So it's somewhere there in between the yes or no. Um, and in this, this kind of distributions and aggregate uh, solutions do uh, allow us to actually start comparing them. When you have yes or no, you cannot compare the world. It's either there or there. But when you have uh, this sort of uh, in-between cases, you are able to say which are more depicting women uh, and which are uh, uh, less. And the, the thing is, that lots of um, 
Lots of examples like this exist. The world is much more in between the yes or no than actual strictly uh, yes or no. And um, uh, so these are the seven myths. And I hope I sort of made it clear for you with this uh, example is that just this one simple example uh, broke the first four myths that are uh, depicted here, just uh, we, in, one, in one go. And um, so I hope I managed to sort of make it uh, clear uh, for you that uh, basically it's very difficult to fit the world around us, and especially the world related to culture and arts in this binary world, in these buckets of yes or no's, uh, and treating them equally good or equally bad. Uh, it's also, my slides advancement is very slow. I'm sorry about that. Hmm. Interesting. Oh, my browser crashed. Um, well, let me see what I can do in order to repair it. <coughs> Sorry about that. No. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to. Lost a little. Let me see if I close this. All right, I think I might have resolved it. Do it, it just, I don't know why it wouldn't go full screen. Well, let's see, maybe like this, I will have some. Uh, anyway, let's, let's just uh, uh, leave it to this. Um, and I will skip a couple of uh, slides uh, further. Uh, uh, just to uh, compensate uh, of the time. And um, so what I was trying to show you how those myths that, that seemed very um, 
uh, so really defining our comfort zone. It's okay to work this way. It's okay to have those assumptions. Uh, what happens when we move into this new era uh, of digital cultures, digital life, uh, uh, an explosion of AI, we can no longer, uh, those assumptions actually don't work. And it's really important for us to break the comfort zone. It's important to uh, encourage more disagreement so that we can actually use it as a signal and study it more um, uh, in order to be able to compare the world around us. And we have done a lot of crowdsourcing tasks. We have used crowd in order to capture this disagreement, uh, to capture this multitude of perspectives. Um, on various types of uh, uh, content, on images, uh, specific parts of the image. Uh, we have uh, also done what we call niche sourcing tasks where we are not saying experts don't exist or experts are not important. What we are trying to say is experts are just part of the whole multitude of op opinions. So we have also done specific expert uh, acquisition tasks where we don't just ask one expert, but uh, 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 online a large uh, uh, community of experts. Um, we have uh, annotated videos, uh, uh, various types of sentences, uh, and so on. And uh, here, I'll just give you a very a, a glimpse on, in what in how we actually did this harnessing of disagreement uh, through uh, various uh, crowdsourcing tasks. Uh, and I'll uh, switch to some textual representation because I think text is very interesting in terms of ambiguity. It's not so obvious when you see text that it's ambiguous. It's much more obvious, easy example that I gave you with images. Uh, so if you read this sentence among 56 subjects reporting to a clinic uh, with symptoms of malaria, 53 had ordinary effective levels of chloroquine in their blood. Uh, so to the simple, again, the simple question, does, just like in the image, is there a relationship uh, between malaria and chloroquine of a type treatment? So does chloroquine actually uh, treat malaria? Um, and when you ask a crowd of this, uh, 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 this um, question in the setting that I just showed you, uh, we now, in order to harness the disagreement, we are not asking a binary question anymore. So we switch from this binary world into actually a world where uh, uh, the annotators can choose a multitude of applicable relation. So to the question, what is the relation between the two, malaria and chloroquine, we see that multiple crowd is uh, present, uh, is selecting multitude of uh, relation. And those multitude of relation are captured in this kind of vectors per annotator. So this is, would be the result of one annotator, where this specific annotator said, well, in this sentence, it's a little bit of symptom, it's a little bit of treat relation, it's a little bit of associated with, and there might be also other relations between those two terms. And then you can repeat this uh, with multi multiple annotators. And in most of our tasks, we do 10 to 15 annotators per single sentence. And what happens afterwards, you can uh, aggregate the answers of all those uh, uh, annotators into, sum them into one uh, vector, which we typically call a sentence vector. And now this vector represents the votes of all the workers, so of all of annotators that see in this sentence. And here the picture is very much different than what if we would have asked the single expert annotator a binary question, is it a treat relation or not? Now we see that actually treat is not as um, well represented as a symptom, for example. And there are other relations, the manifestation, uh, some people also say there are, there's not really a specific relation in this sentence. And if you take different types of sentences, you will see different distributions over the annotator's votes. And this is a, a, a very 
a fundamental point here in the way we harness this agreement. Each of those vector representation for, a, uh, for three different sentences basically allow us, just like with the images, to compare those sentences, to compare the level of ambiguity for a target annotation uh, uh, represented in the sentence. In the first one, you can see almost everybody has voted 14 out of 15 people have said, well, this is really a treat relation. In the, in the second one, six out of 15 people voted, and four, of, four additional ones voted that there must be another relation, that it's not part of the ones that we have provided to them. And in the last one, there is another uh, a completely different uh, relation actually uh, coming up. And, and what is... Uh, Interesting here to see, and hopefully it's clear from those from this example, is that it does uh, really uh, show that there is no space uh, for the comfort zone to be defined like this. So that we, uh, by introducing uh, this uh, encouragement for this agreement, we really disrupt the comfort zone and create a very, very um, uh, interesting signal um, uh, for uh, understanding better ambiguity, understanding better um, uh, uh, different representation of semantics in different forms, whether it's images, videos, text, or so on. Um, and it's interesting uh, just to tell you for this where this, uh, why all of a sudden I switched to this example, uh, m a medical text. Uh, so in uh, 2012 I joined uh, the, uh, the Watson team at IBM and was part of the effort to try to adapt the uh, Watson system into a new domain from the Jeopardy uh, open question answering to medical question answering. So we started uh, these experiments with trying to gather uh, annotations from the crowd on medical sentence and specifically uh, for medical sentence uh, uh, rela uh, uh, medical relations. And the idea was to use the, the knowledge on the web uh, processing it um, uh, with uh, crowd knowledge in order to extend uh, knowledge structures, existing medical knowledge structures. And in this case, this was uh, a knowledge structure called uh, UMLS, where um, already a lot of relations, medical relations were existing. However, lots of them were missing. And for many of them, they were also not um, uh, suitable examples. So uh, this effort actually uh, uh, contributed to extending the UMLS with new relations, but also providing much more accurate examples. And when I say accurate, it actually means examples that represent this kind of level of ambiguity rather than saying this is a positive example for this or not. And all this collection of data ultimately creates a vector space. Uh, and this uh, vector space is um, very closely related uh, to the, what I mentioned also in the history and uh, with the medical relation extraction to this knowledge graph uh, world that we are trying to uh, uh, present. So it ultimately, this vector space is actually uh, a hyperdimensional space where every aspect of, the, of your knowledge space, uh, in this case either relations um, or um, the attributes of the relations, create a, a large uh, dimension, uh, multiple dimensions in the space. And the answers of all of those annotators are actually distributed uh, within this um, uh, hyperspace. And if I, I will try to sort of simplify it a little bit for you uh, and to show you, uh, if you encode this hyperspace, hyperspace is very difficult to visualize. So it's a multi-dimensional space. Uh, in the case of uh, the medical relation extraction, we had 12 relations uh, for which uh, we were uh, targeting. Uh, 
So it will be a 12 relation space uh, where every um, uh, a sentence or every annotator will be an axis in this space. And you can, for, however, visualize a three-dimensional space. And in this case, we can visualize the hyperspace as a three-dimensional three-axis tensor, which uh, in a typical world, it will be just a matrix. Uh, but we start adding new, um, uh, we start adding uh, new axes. For example, the typical axis that we add here is that we introduce the annotators as uh, part of the space, we have uh, uh, one of the axes is devoted to the target semantics. In this case, will be either the medical relation extraction or uh, what we uh, saw with the images would be um, the annotation of uh, women. Uh, and we have also an axis related to uh, sentences or images or whatever the, the target uh, domain is. And the interesting thing is that the cells of this ten the tensor um, are the individual votes of each annotator. Um, and they represent the vote of the annotator for a given sentence, for a given relation. Uh, and, and so now you can see how from this space, you actually can uh, take the plane which defines um, the cho choices of annotators for their relation for every single sentence, you can actually create, uh, shrink the sentence space into the sentence vector. And that's how we are uh, aggregating all the votes of all the uh, workers in order to create the representation of every example. And so you can continue visualizing uh, uh, and browsing through the space by looking at specific uh, planes. So you can look at every single sentence in your corpus through examining the plane uh, where workers have given um, um, uh, annotations. Uh, you can intersect them, so you can actually create a lot of metrics that allow you to uh, compare uh, from different points of view. Um, and, uh, and that's what actually makes it a, a hyper, um, uh, a hyper dimensional uh, space ultimately. Um, and in my opinion, this uh, hyper dimensional space, the way we gather this data fits much better the smoothness of the world. The fact that there are way more examples that are a little bit uh, just a little bit true or a little bit false, that they are falling into what we call the gray zone uh, in, in, um, in between. Um, and we did prove in most of our experiments that uh, disagreement is really a signal of this and helps systems understand better the space. Um, so I'll maybe skip this. So these are various types of ways you can actually monitor the space. You can look at how, uh, uh, how uh, uh, the annotators behave from sentence to sentence or from image to image in order to measure the quality of the annotators. You can compare them with each other. You can see how they agree or disagree uh, on different, uh, um, uh, in, the, in the planes, either for the sentences or for the relations. Um, and it is really a, a, a very fascinating uh, space in order to, be, uh, to understand better semantics in order to understand better uh, human expression of the semantics and also the human interpretation of the semantics captured in images, um, text, and um, other media. And so what we ultimately create is a model. So in this hyperdimensional space, we try to model it and we call it, uh, we base it on a triangle of meaning uh, which was introduced in 1936 by Ogden and Richards, which really tells you that every object in the space is observed by people and interpreted according to a particular meaning, uh, a target meaning that they are known. Uh, and that's exactly what 
our crowdsourcing tasks do. Uh, we are creating tasks in which we allow people to observe the objects in the space in a very wide uh, space, unrestricted uh, semantic space. And what we additionally also do, we allow this to be a continuously iterative process. So by uh, using the, the space and the representation in the space in order to continuously measure a level of ambiguity or level of clarity uh, in, the, um, in the examples, the behavior, whether there's a spam behavior, low quality annotators, and what is the level of clarity or ambiguity in the target uh, annotations or uh, relations. And what we actually notice is that those iterations really converge at some point. So the more you apply uh, uh, this, um, uh, this new set of metrics, we give you a higher quality. And this quality is no longer based on the very simplistic notion of how many people agreed or uh, agreed on a particular answer. Uh, it does take the, all, every aspect of the triangle at any point of time takes it in consideration. Um, and if you remember, I showed you a sentence where all the workers agreed, all the annotators, most of the annotators agreed, and one has given a, um, a, a different vote for another relation. If we apply the triangle, what we see uh, is, uh, w or if we just enter into, into the hyperspace, if we look at who was this annotator who gave this vote, uh, we can also see, well, hey, this guy has uh, actually annotated this relation for every single sentence that he has seen. Uh, so there is something suspicious and spammy in his behavior. So we, his quality as an annotator uh, actually uh, drops. Um, oops. Uh, his quality as annotator actually uh, uh, drops. And I think I uh, uh, missed it. Um, I think it's further down in, the, in my slides where um, I, I can show you how actually uh, the, knowing that this worker is a spammer or this annotator is a spammer, uh, the, even this single vote can drop down by applying the uh, triangle in iteration. And, uh, oh, actually it's here. So if I apply, uh, it in iteration, so knowing this, then the vote of this worker actually now will be much, have much less weight in the overall distribution. And that's the power of applying the triangle, uh, the triangle of meaning um, uh, in a uh, uh, multitude of iterations. Um, so I will just give you the last uh, uh, visualization um, of this uh, uh, knowledge tensor, as we call it. So ultimately, we performed a lot of experiments, uh, text, uh, images, videos, sounds. Uh, we collected data from, from the crowd, and we tried to prove the, 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 this uh, sort of instinct that we had in the beginning is actually not a coincidence, but it's uh, um, something that reoccurs in everything uh, in the different types of domains we considered. And we called it uh, crowd truth. Um, so uh, we, this is, for example, in the medical domain where we compared uh, the results of the crowd which in some cases outperformed the uh, annotations uh, performance, uh, performance of system trained on expert annotations. And in many cases, they actually, the crowd performed as equally good um, as the experts. Uh, here as well, you can see that um, it is very important to have reliable, to prove that your results are, when you're using crowd, to prove that your results are reliable. Um, and the, lo the smaller amount of workers you have, the smaller amount of annotation, the, the bigger the chances that you're just uh, taking an arbitrary voice. So we uh, f uh, found out that there is a, a very strong correlation uh, between a classifier for medical relations, getting the answer right, um, and um, the measures of um, uh, ambiguity uh, for every sentence. And we have done this and showed the same behavior in multiple uh, domains. Um, 
And you can actually go at uh, crowdsroot.org um, and uh, look at the data. We publish all the data there. And, um, and also all the code in order to be able to uh, perform this uh, kind of iterative uh, annotations um, um, and see how this agreement, harnessing this agreement, actually does make the world a little bit better <laughs> in, in our uh, uh, context. Um, and before I finish, I would like to give you uh, a, a number of examples um, where we uh, did apply uh, either inspired or did apply CrowdSroot. So this was our first uh, crowdsourcing experiment many years ago, which actually showed us for the first time the difference between lay people as interpreters and experts. And what was the most interesting uh, um, finding in this research is that they are very complementary. So that was the first indication that experts, we don't claim experts are bad or good. They just have one point of view. And other people have other points of view. And when you bring them together, they actually answer different type of questions, which is exactly what the web wants to have, to actually cover the more uh, answerability uh, of questions with the information provided online. And it was, this was focused on annotating videos and comparing uh, on video annotations between in-house experts in the audiovisual archive and uh, crowdsourcing game uh, results that we gathered. Um, another interesting example that we are uh, working um, um, in the last uh, few years, uh, it's a, a, a browser, it's a cultural heritage browser um, that we uh, created for exploratory search. And their exploratory search is extremely important to actually capture the notion of vagueness, the notion of slightly related, of possibly related. And what we notice is capturing uh, uh, annotation on uh, cultural heritage uh, uh, images and videos uh, through crowd actually allows us to uh, create in the back end much richer graphs uh, on, uh, and provide um, interesting exploration paths, automatically provide interesting exploration paths uh, to uh, humanities, digital humanities scholars. And I had a, um, a nice video to show you here, an experiment we did, oh, experiment we did with um, uh, one of the museums in the Netherlands and IBM to try to uh, automatically generate questions about paintings. Um, so do I have, uh, it's uh, less than a minute to, let's see whether it's um, really <laughs> anxious to try anything else. The anatomy lesson of Dr. Nicolas Taupe is the perfect place to start. It's a very important painting, a key painting, in the development of Rembrandt's work. Thinking about Rembrandt, it became even more interesting because sometimes expert opinions are divided, they may not always be the same, and we realized that Watson could deal with ambiguity, could deal with different types of opinions. And so on. So let me see whether I can now switch to actually to my slides. Back. I knew it was a bad idea. <laughs> Recovery mode. Um, so uh, this, uh, yeah, the experiment with the uh, IBM and uh, the Mauritz House in the Netherlands uh, is quite interesting to show. Uh, actually, using um, part of the new uh, Watson APIs, uh, various tools, uh, in order to automatically ask uh, questions uh, about paintings. And the main way we actually gather this train, this data, uh, gather training data was through uh, crowdsourcing. 
Uh, another um, uh, context where we are aiming to use crowdsourcing <clears throat> is to try to help broadcasters understand their audiences on different uh, social media or different online channels by repurposing or reusing their videos across different channels. Um, and another uh, interesting uh, context for uh, exploring diversity is trying to capture bias uh, in the way uh, media is represented and ultimately help uh, do our contribution in sort of detecting better things uh, uh, like uh, fake news or propaganda messages uh, represented in media sources. Um, and we have currently uh, have uh, two outside of academia examples. Uh, so CrowdTruth Triangle has been applied uh, for uh, Google Maps reviews where it really showed about 8% uh, uh, improvement of coverage uh, for reviews on Google Maps for places. Uh, which is uh, an enormous improvement considering that there, we are talking here about millions of users and uh, places. Uh, and another example at New York Times uh, for experiment uh, um, collecting emotional responses of people to uh, uh, newspaper articles, uh, CrowdTruth also improved the uh, accuracy of uh, their emotional classifier uh, significantly. So, and to sum up, um, uh, I think these are the main, <clears throat> the main conclusions uh, in terms of uh, uh, what uh, CrowdTruth delivered to us. I hope I managed to, uh, to convince you this agreement is not a bad thing, but is actually a signal, a uh, useful signal to uh, create uh, a spatial representation of meaning rather than a binary representation of uh, uh, meaning um, and to sort of help you explore this hyperdimensional space. Truth is a very complex thing um, and uh, we, we will be fooling it ourselves if we continue thinking that it's only a binary um, uh, outcome. So it's a truly hyperdimensional space and ambiguity plays a very important role. Understanding ambiguity plays a very important role there. Um, and that's uh, uh, the end of my uh, talk. Uh, there are a bunch of people with whom I've been working over, e over the years uh, in the uh, cultural heritage domain um, uh, as well as uh, the CrowdTruth team, which uh, sort of evolved over the years since 2012 until now. Uh, we applied the, this as research, but also in education. So we are giving uh, education related to training uh, uh, cognitive systems like Watson uh, through CrowdTruth and crowdsourcing. And um, that's all I have to say today. I hope I managed to convince you. Yeah, that's a very good question, and I think uh, ambiguity um, comes has different sources. It can either be the sentence or the image is ambiguous uh, intrinsically, and the more ambiguous is, the more it will actually trigger the inconsistencies in individual people. Uh, however, when you aggregate, the larger the amount of people you aggregate, the smaller those differences become, both in terms of the target sentences or images and both in terms of your personal inconsistencies. Um, and so you become just one in a large crowd. And that's, that's fine. So we don't want to uh, decrease it. Uh, we just don't want to give it the, uh, uh, if you are, the less people you're asking, all those individual differences and inconsistencies will have much bigger impact the increasing of the amount of the crowd that you're asking actually decreases the individual impact, but keeps it there. Any other questions? So also thank you for your keynote. Um, maybe it's a bit of a follow-up question. So what would maybe change or would it make sense at all if we give um, individuals the um, option to, I don't know, express some kind of confidence level on a specific item, so I mean, 
mean, if I, if I read the sentence, and I'm not medical, uh, medical staff, so maybe I would say something like, okay, it sounds a lot like it's treatment related or symptom related, but it could also be this, but with this, I have only, I don't know, 10% confidence. Yeah, so that's, uh, it is related, and I think um, uh, people are extremely incapable of judging reliably their own confidence level. So many people just say, I'm 100% sure. Based on what? Other people, they say, I'm not sure. Neither of those statements can be uh, empirically proven. So asking people for their confidence level is very unreliable. But what we do, we, just by the fact that they, we allow them to choose multiple things at the same time, just by the fact that they choose multiple things already indicates I am doubting. I think it's this, but it's possibly this. And I don't need to say how big is my confidence, because if we ask a larger crowd of people, this confidence comes a natural part of the aggregation of the results. This individual doubts, when you aggregate them, will give you those 50% or 70% of telling you this sentence expresses 20% this relation and possibly 30% this relation and possibly 70% this relation. And it doesn't need to sum up to 100 because each of those relations can be strongly expressed and weakly expressed uh, and uh, not necessarily all of them together should sum up to 100. So does this give you an answer? <laughs> we have time for one more question. This one? Yes, please. Uh, you call this, this approach a crowd truth, but uh, shouldn't it be called crowd meaning or crowd belief? Because um, if, uh, let me say, 80% of people believe that something is true, but in fact it isn't, or it will prove 10 years that it was not true 10 years ago, uh, then this is, this is not truth, but this is what people believe or mean or Well, there is no truth. I, I have a talk which I call truth is a lie. I truly believe there is no truth. There are only perspectives. There are perspectives, opinions. There are things that are right now maybe valid tomorrow, not anymore. Ten years ago, people didn't even know about them. And the importance of this is that uh, one of the, uh, the two last myths that I didn't explain but was we did we have created a culture of collecting annotation data. We collect it now, and we, it should be valid forever. Uh, and with the crowd truth method, what we uh, show is that you have to keep doing it continuously so that you can actually capture this uh, drift of concepts and change of concepts over time and, uh, and not say whether it was true before and now not anymore, but to be able to compare it. How was before? How is it now? Did it go up or down? Did it disappear completely? And so on. I think ultimately we don't... Um, we don't do ourselves a favor of trying to understand what is perfectly true because everything you believe, you can find another person that believes exactly the opposite. And it won't be one person. It will be probably millions of people uh, uh, which either support you or support something else. So for us, it's much more important to understand the spread, the, the whole, uh, uh, to see the whole distribution of people, uh, the beliefs of people, or um, interpretations of people and try to compare the world objects according to their beliefs. That's what crowd truth does. It gathers large amounts of very diverse interpretations and shows you uh, <coughs> corpus of images or corpus of sentences according to their interpretation. And from that point on, you can use this as a training data and you can decide where is my threshold for for reliability. If it's a medical domain, maybe you 95% is not good enough. So maybe you just go to something which is higher than that. If it's arts and culture, well, everything's okay there. So this is uh, basically, key, um, I mean, it sounds uh, strange the way I said it, but it's okay to uh, show a lower level of confidence as a way of inspiring 
um, uh, new way of thinking or serendipitous relationships between uh, cultural heritage objects. Okay, thank you very much. You're um, welcome. Yeah, digital cultures, we heard a lot about it, about truth. Um, we heard about digital cultures. There is, of course, not only digital culture, we have a, a hosting culture as well, and we want to show you here in Chemnitz also uh, our culture by heart to organize conferences and to run conferences. First of all, there's culture in a box for our presenter and keynote speaker this morning, um, which is from, we have just a very small picture, but you might know it, it's a, it's a cultural non-digital item. It's a so-called Räuchermännchen, which is a... <laughs> I, I, ch I checked the translation, but I thought it's a, the German uh, word is, is first of all, I, I guess you can understand it. And, <laughs> and uh, second, I think this is also part of the culture uh, that on a global level we have to work closer together to learn from each other's languages as well, because this is also part of our different cultures. And um, yeah, so the Räuchermännchen is a cultural good from this region. and it's usually used and applied in Christmas time during December and I hope it will bring some atmosphere from Chemnitz to Amsterdam. Once again, thank you, thank you very much, Noah, for your talk.